what I'm here to do today is to tell you about the exciting world of deep learning and the role of data in it. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about a problem with data and deep learning and uh, basically practical solutions to solve that problem. Um, I will attempt to leave two to five minutes at the end for questions, and I will try to make the sort of ratio of information to shilling about 90 to 10 percent. Um, so let me know if you have any feedback. But as a quick intro for me, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO at a company called Aquarium, and uh, I'll go into that later in, in the 10 percent of the shilling part. But you know, apart from that, I worked on deep learning systems for a number of years at a company called Cruise that was building self-driving car stuff. Before that, I worked on this framework called Cafe at Berkeley, which was you know kind of the original deep learning framework um, before TensorFlow and PyTorch came on the scene. But um, the thing I'm here to talk to you about today is this idea that has been getting a lot of credence in you know, recent years. You know, Andre Karpathy and you know, Andrew Ng go up and they talk about how you know, there's this idea of data-centric ML or that like, you know, people should really focus on working on the data to get improvement to their machine learning models. And you know, most practitioners, I think, would agree that this is the case. So if you want to like work on your data, you know, working on your data typically gets you a lot higher ROI in terms of improving your machine learning model performance at the end of the day compared to you know, working on other stuff like hyperparameter tuning. So that's a cool idea. That's awesome. Um, problem is it's all like you know, <laughs> high level, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that sounds great, but what do I actually do? Um, and so some part of this is, okay, well, let's try and understand the motivation of why this is important. And then we can talk about like practical tips for you to apply this to your own setup or workflow. So I think number one, the reason why we talk about this is because if you want to improve a machine learning model, then you have you know, basically two options. In regular software engineering, you have the code. And as in machine learning, you also have code. And you can make improvements to that in terms of changing your model architecture, changing the way that your model is trained in terms of the parameters, things like that. But you also have this new thing that is not present in most software engineering, which is the idea of data, which is what makes machine learning. Machine learning, you know, you train this model code on the data, you produce this model that then does some stuff that you want. So when you want to improve your ML system, you want to improve both of these as fast as you can and as frequently as you can, and then you get better models that you can then ship into production. Um, and so now comes the part where, you know, obviously we've been doing machine learning for quite a number of decades. You know, what's so different about this whole data set ML thing now? And the reason why is because there has been this shift towards working on deep learning as opposed to what previously was the big thing, which was structured and machine learning. So if you look at, you know, Google, Facebook, a lot of companies in the early 2000s to 2010s, you know, they were focusing on tasks like forecasting, recommendation, ags targeting, focusing on data types that you can store in a SQL database and, you know, the sort of thing that you look at in that sort of domain is that you have data that comes to you for free because a lot of the time you have millions of users on your site that are just like clicking around and you know your task in machine learning is you want to be able to predict what they're going to do better so that you can you know sell them ads or like you know sell them things on your e-commerce site so you know the algorithms were more things that were like traditional like you know non deep learning algorithms like logistic regression and the sort of focus of the work the the people who get paid the most were the data scientists because you know since the data came for free you just need to kind of crank through the data more frequently you got to retrain the model you know every week every day you got to like you know scale it to you know millions billions of data points um, but then most of the improvement to the models came from feature engineering on the structured data or like you know doing stuff on like experimentation with the models like you know sparse models or you know trying new algorithms or ways of training it or something like that but with deep learning you have a different paradigm now you deal with uh, unstructured data like imagery like audio which has its own set of challenges to handle you're using deep learning models to handle this data and then now you have this sort of economic shift, which is that the data does not come for free. You know, now you actually have to go and pay companies like Scale or Labelbox, or maybe you build your own system where you get a bunch of people offshore to go draw boxes on this is a car, this is a person, this is what the person was saying in the audio clip, that sort of thing. And so now as a result, like, you know, because the models are pretty good, because you can get a lot of pre-trained deep neural nets, you know, just off the shelf from open source, like, you know, they're pretty good. You can't really do that much to improve on what Facebook AI research or Google Brain has done, so there's not much you can do there. 
the data pipelines, you know, you still need to scale it, of course, so there's gonna be tools that help you with that, but now you have this limitation, which is since you don't have all the data coming to you for free, you have this decision, which is like, okay, well, I collect a lot of data, but I can't label all of it. And when I do label it, you know, is it good or is it bad? And also, what should I spend my limited dollars on labeling in order to get the most impact to improve your model? So now, everyone's talking about what do we need to do to work on the data? Because it's a new sort of problem that was created by a new paradigm of doing machine learning. So now we go from like, you know, the high level, okay, well, why do we care about this to, okay, what do we do? And, you know, if you kind of break it down into steps, I want to make my data better. What do I need to do? Well, you have kind of like a feedback loop, right? You have like this sort of iteration cycle, just like you have with like software engineering. One, what is the problem? You know, is it a problem with your data? Is it a problem with your model? You know, like what are the problems? Two is like, why are they happening? You know, is it a problem where, you know, the data is being mislabeled? Is it a problem where like it's inconsistent? Is it a problem where you don't have enough of something that's hard? And then you gotta go take actions to fix the data, you know, edit things, modify things, add stuff, remove stuff. And then as you change your data, retrain your model, you gotta make sure that the model's getting better, or the problems are getting fixed, and then cool, get it out into production. And then you repeat this again and again and again until you have a much better model in production. So it's kind of like agile software development, but with machine learning. So this goes into, okay, well like what are the type of problems you have and what do you do to solve them? So in unstructured data, you have you know, various different types of what I would call data problems. So the sort of, you know, I phrase it as like Maslow's hierarchy of ML. So at the base of it, you wanna have data that itself is good. Like, you know, your images or your audio have to be like not malformed. So if you see, for example, you know, this is very common with some images where the hardware can screw up and produce something that's distorted. This is like, you know, the stuff in my SQL database is, you know, garbled or something by some process that happened ahead of it. So you should probably just fix that. That's like data cleanliness. On top of that though, you have this operational process which is we need to get people to label data to tell the model what to do. And because you have people labeling this data, the people make mistakes. So this is idea of labeling errors or inconsistencies or ambiguities. So this is an example from one of Andrew Ng's talks where you have these defects in like a sheet of metal. Well, one labeler says, I'm gonna draw a box around each of the little dots. And then the other labeler says, I'm gonna draw a box around all of them. And you know, both are kind of like technically correct, but since they're inconsistent, it confuses the model, the model screws up, and then like, you know, doesn't do what you want. And then beyond that, you have higher level problems, like, okay, well, like, you know, I don't have enough examples of a certain rare case. Or for example, you have something that is happening in production that isn't happening in the set that your model's training on, so the model doesn't know what to do and it can't handle it. So you have to be able to diagnose all these problems and understand the resolutions you have to take to, to fix them. So this gets into the point of how do I find the problems? And you know, all those steps that I highlighted in the feedback loop, they have their own sort of problems and how do you need to like, you know, set up a workflow that solves them efficiently. So I'm just gonna talk about just problem discovery. How do you even know where the problems are? Because likely you have a data set that you're training your model on that is like millions of examples, but probably only a few of them are actually like bad. You know, only a few of them have bad labels. Maybe only a few of them have, you know, like, you know, difficult scenarios that your model struggles with. So one way to do this is that you have an operational process and you just spend a lot of money on it. So if I want to find all the label errors in my data set, well, one thing I can do is I can just pay three different people to go look through every point in my data set and double check or triple check each other. And you can get like 95, 99% label accuracy, but you pay three times as much. <laughs> so this is not very feasible for most people to do, right? Another example is how do I understand what are the types of things that my model sucks on so I can get more data at that? Well, the way that you, know, you do this is, you know, there's a famous story of, you know, Andre Karpathy just like spending like two, three hours every day just like looking through every single example in his data set one by one and building some mental intuition, mental clustering of what the failure cases are. But you know, that doesn't scale, right? That's also just kind of a waste of talent, I think. But so you wanna do this in a more efficient way. You wanna find, here are these like needles in the haystack and you wanna be able to search through your large data set to be able to get them efficiently. And so what you wanna do is you wanna set up essentially a feedback loop. You wanna be able to set up a way that you discover these in an efficient way. 
And so one thing that you can do that is more domain specific is have a way to double check what is going on in your data or in your model. And so one thing you can do is you can have humans go and actually double check some sample of the predictions that your model outputs. And you know, this is basically domain specific because sometimes your model runs once a day, that's easy to check. Other times it runs 10 times a second, that's hard to check. <laughs> so, uh, and then you can also do things where you can check you know, disagreements or agreements between different systems like ensembles or you know, heuristic versus learned systems, whatever, right? But the other thing you can do is you can actually ask the model where it thinks things are hard and have the model essentially automate the process of searching through your data to tell you where the problems in the data are, which is like kind of a weird, unintuitive concept, but you know, I can explain that a little bit more. So there's a few different things you can do. You can try to like, you know, surface labeling errors automatically by checking the places where the model and the data disagree. You can find error patterns in the model by essentially asking it what it thinks is similar or dissimilar in the data set. Or you can understand the difference in distribution between what you are seeing in your training environment versus what you see in production. So this is an example of a self-driving data set where you do object detection, draw a box around a car or a pedestrian or whatever. And it turns out you know, the, the dumb way, of course, of finding labeling errors is you just manually check everything. But what you can do is you can ask the model, here are the things that the model is very confident about where it disagrees with the human annotations, the labels, and it turns out it bubbles up all these places where the model was right and the humans were wrong. So instead of you know, looking through all million data points to find the problems, you find sort of the thousand things that bubble up to the top. Saves you a lot of time. But you still have a human to like double check, yeah, this is right, this is wrong, but that human is an expert. And now they're looking through like a thousand things instead of a million things. So those dashed lines are all like, you know, boxes around cars that are correctly there, but uh, we're not labeled in. You know, a similar thing can happen not only in, you know, let's say images, but also in different types of sensor modality, because, you know, deep learning basically allows you to run on different types of, like, sensors um, and still get, like, similar results. So in this case, you have a 3D object detection task where you have, like, a 3D point cloud from a, a LiDAR sensor or a 3D sensor and your task is to draw a box around it. And sometimes the model will detect things that are just not labeled by the annotators. And look, you know, like there's actually a person that's just kind of like hidden there in the distance and the model correctly detects it with high confidence, but it just wasn't labeled in, you know, even though the guy next to him was labeled in, so now you found a labeling error. Another problem you have is like, okay, well like, you know, in these sort of like deep learning scenarios, you have a lot of patterns of edge cases and uh, it follows kind of this tail distribution where like your model tends to do very well on the common case, and then you have these sort of rarer and rarer edge cases and then suddenly the model doesn't do so well because it hasn't seen many examples. And so you need to be able to identify, okay, well, what are the things in my long tail that my model struggles on and then how do I get more data of them? And so one thing you can do is you can use something called a neural network embedding. And this is something that's well known from the language processing field, but essentially what you can do is you can ask a neural network to tell you what it thinks is similar or dissimilar in a data set. So if you have a bunch of images or a bunch of audio clips or a bunch of point clouds, you can say, okay, well here's a bunch of stuff that I think is similar to each other and here's a bunch of stuff I think is like an outlier. And you can represent it in this nice visualization that allows you to kind of understand here's the layout of the distribution of my data set. So in this case, you have a bunch of images of you know, Shiba Inus, and you can see that the vast majority of Shiba Inus are in this cluster in the middle because they're all like orange coats. But if you look at some of the outliers, you see that you know, there's Shiba Inus that have white coats. And in, you know, what you can do is you can then understand, okay, well, if my model fails on particular sort of subsets of the data, then you know, that's something where I may want to understand that this is a cluster of stuff that my model consistently disagrees with the label on and therefore that's an edge case. And then also, if I know that this is something where the model consistently fails on it, I wanna go and collect more data and label that and retrain my model on that. What we can actually do is then say, okay, let's use these embeddings to search through my unlabeled data, like you know, a search engine, and then use that to do essentially targeted data collection instead of you having to manually dig through it. Uh, so yeah, that's the 90%. Here's the 10% shell. We build tools that make all this stuff easier. So you know, we have a vested interest in uh, this problem being big, but you know, to be honest, like this is kind of the tool that I wanted when I was at Cruise, and uh, I wish we had it. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of the thing that 
I feel like it's just been really useful for doing sort of normal deep learning tasks where you have an incentive to make something better in production and you want to do it faster, you want to ship better models and we're building tools that kind of makes that happen. So let's see, I think we might be out of time. Ooh, all right, well, I'll be in office hours.